Cascading Friends of Medicine. I just met her today, but I received her curriculum vitae earlier, and it's 25 pages of awesomeness. <laughs> uh, it just kept coming out of the printer. I was like, man, that's amazing. <laughs> Uh, so here's, here's some highlights um, just from an experience level. Chief Physician, Major United States Air Force, Assistant Medical Examiner to the Armed Forces Medical Examiner Department, 1989-90. Former Chief Deputy Medical Examiner to the Armed Forces Medical Examiner Department, 1990-92. From 92-96, former Chief Medical Examiner of Washington, D.C., 96-2002 here in Harris County, former Chief Medical Examiner She's been a forensic pathology consultant from 2002 to the present. Numerous speaking engagements, writing. It's uh, extensive and it's fantastic, and we're so lucky to have her today. So uh, please welcome Dr. Carter. Hey, I guess I'll stand here, and I just want to go over just a little overview of things I run into with uh, defense attorneys, and I've left lots of room for, for questions, and I have a few questions for, for all of you. So my name is Dr. Joy Carter, and I have been in forensic pathology going on 35 years. So moisturizing works. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got my start in forensics uh, from being in high school in Indianapolis, Indiana, the home of Eli Lilly, the career sampling program. And at age of 14, I got a part-time job at a uh, Catholic hospital helping to make food for the um, physician staff. And after I burned my hand with coffee, the workers shooed me into the hallway. Mm -hmm. And back in the 70s, the kitchen and the morgue were in very close proximity. <laughs> and I literally saw the sisters wheeling, up, back then they had sisters in there, and they were wheeling a body that was shrouded in, in the uh, white sheets and blood was seeping through. And the first thing my sister said was, you don't want to know what's going on here. Well, I was 14. I wanted to know everything that was going on. <laughs> and so uh, they actually let me see after a lot of begging. And um, I hopped a ride over to the General Hospital in Indianapolis. And I watched my first autopsy when I was 14. And I remember the doctor, Dr. Benz is his name. He did the autopsy. He pointed out the injuries. Uh, it was a motorcycle operator, pedal marks, and then he talked to the police, and then he talked to the family. The family actually donated the brains. It was like the total package for me. From that point on, I started my uh, foray into uh, forensics. I was mentored by Dr. Joe Davis, who was the great late uh, chief uh, medical examiner of uh, Dade County, and uh, he mentored me through uh, letter writing about maybe every three to six months until we met in person when I was in medical school. So that started me off in that way. My career goal in high school was to be the chief medical examiner of Washington, D.C. So I want to go over a little bit about forensic medicine. And for the next slide. Where just is hit, it? Oh. Just hit the, yeah. okay. We have a mouse. space bar. Or the space bar okay. is probably just going to get you to Do the I need screen. to be on this side then? Let's see there. Oh. Next screen. Okay. So if you just hit the space bar, Okay, well, let me, let me try it again. Okay, um, so when I was the chief medical examiner here in Houston, we did not have a public defender's office. And I often wondered why not? Because coming from uh, Washington, D.C., uh, we had a great public defender's office and we worked with them hand in hand. And my forensic training uh, was done at the Dade County Medical Examiner's Office with Dr. Joe Davis and Janet Reno. And so it was impressed upon us that we were to be neutral at, at all times. So coming here and with all the capital punishment cases and not having public defenders was very troubling to me. And I can remember one time I went over to the prosecutor's office, the district attorney's office here, and they heard some of the assistants were wearing t-shirts with numbers on them. And, uh, Tony Holmes and our relationship was probably very well publicized, but we actually had a lot of respect for each other, but he told me those are the numbers of people who had been put to death, which I thought was so tasteless. I said, I can't believe they're wearing these t-shirts, but they were wearing them in the office only. So I'm so glad that you all are here now, because I think when you have a city as large as Houston and all the crimes going on, that people really do need good public offense. And when I also came to the Harris County Medical Examiner's Office, they weren't even letting police in on a regular basis. So they were not doing things, everything properly so that there was a well-rounded trial. 
So my job at that point was to modernize the office, make it open, and make sure that our information was correct and that we were putting out. So you've heard a little bit about my background. Again, I am from the Midwest, ergo the accent. Um, my Ooh, background. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, all okay. right. Um, my military background came from, I guess, just being patriotic. And I knew I was going to go to medical school when I was in high school. But I went to a small school in um, Ohio, Wittenberg. And I went to a job fest after I had decided uh, what school I was going to. And they were offering military scholarships. And so I applied and I got one. And therefore I went to medical school with, with no debt. And I was able to uh, earn my rank. And um, I went through all of my training nonstop. And as soon as I finished my fellowship, I went on as, a, as an officer, officer's training school in Montgomery. Um, Alabama, and um, I joined the staff at the AFIP and moved up the line very quickly because I've always loved teaching and I've always loved forensic pathology. So my main role as the deputy chief of medical examiner was to educate the federal investigative body. So I spent two and a half years flying around the world educating the FBI, the CIA, the State Department, uh, NCIS, the real one, uh, CID and OSI traveling around the world to make sure that they understood forensic principles, uh, that they were prepared to gather the remains of uh, U.S. citizens and active duty military wherever they were around the world. And also as Armed Forces Medical examiners, we did not have autopsy assistance. We actually had to assist each other. So there were many times um, during that time period of my active duty military, we had the Panama invasion, the first Gulf War, so we actually had to assist each, each other. Um, my first position was the District of Columbia as the Chief Medical Examiner. I had been the liaison for the um, military. We did not have our own more, so I would, actually was in charge of the Forensic Fellowship Program, and I sent my fellows to Baltimore primarily. DC at that time was extremely overwhelmed with work, uh, underfunded, and uh, averaging about 500 homicides a year, huge drug wars going on block to block, I don't know if you ever heard of Rafael Edmond, the big drug kingpin. Anybody work in the D.C. office ever? Okay. Rafael Edmond was a young black male in his 20s. He was making about $300 million a year. He's credited with introducing crap to Washington, D.C. He had his grandparents and his parents working for him. His parents worked for the D.C. government. I'm sorry, the federal government. During the day and night, they sold drugs. Mm. So he controlled literally the crack of PCP. Uh, sales in DC. And they took them off the street in 89 and basically just all hell broke loose. So again, we averaged 14 year old uh, homicide victims. They were so young that they had to change the law to prosecute the teenagers. And at that time, the youth were probably better skilled at using the semi automatic weapons. So we had a lot of police officers killed for target <laughs> practice or initiation into gangs. So it was very, very active. Um, we also didn't have any funding. During that time period in Washington, D.C., they re-elected Marion Barry, and then the city cracked down, or the, the commission on, on D.C. cracked down. We had no funding. I think when I decided to leave, I was actually having to spend my own money to get uh, photos publicized to take to court, and we worked with the U.S. Attorney's Office for Adults. And I, I remember the day I decided to leave was we had a meeting, and all the directors of departments, and Mayor and Barry had been over to Africa that someone had paid for. And they threw down these five by seven glossy color photographs. I'm like, you're kidding, right? Because I can't get photographs published to go to court. Um, and I remember when I interviewed for Harris County, someone came up from the judge's office and we were sitting there literally with mittens and hats on because we had no heat. And I thought, I'm not gonna get this job. And they said, hey, you won't run out of toilet paper either because that was apparently publicized. Um, so I came down to Harris County in 1996, and I was armed with the KPMG review of the office. Harris County was not doing enough cases uh, to meet the um, uh, population, and then most of my staff I inherited had not been formally trained in forensics, so they had all kinds of things going on. It was pretty much a closed office. So my job was to open the office, modernize the office, we develop a forensic fellowship program, um, we improved the staff. I think when I came to Harris County, I had 72 employees. 
and 27 cars. So every third person had a car. So the first thing I did to make my staff angry was I took the cars away, including my own. And I set up a pool of cars if you're going to court, and nobody went to scenes but me. And uh, so we kind of cut out that uh, expense. But I think overall, uh, we did a pretty good job of modernizing. We became the first uh, office at that time uh, to be allowed to do mitochondrial DNA. Um, and so we've only continued to grow. And you all, I'm sure, have worked with Dr. Sanchez. And he's my protege. And I brought him up to DC and left him there and brought him down here. And he's doing a, a great job. The office has grown tremendously. I've been a friend of consultant since 2002, which has allowed me to travel around the world again. I do special assignments for the federal government. Um, can't tell you a lot about them, but let's just say I get around. <laughs> And I uh, had made a practice of uh, doing indigent um, defense cases, something again spurred when I was here in a case of Montgomery County of a capital punishment and the defense attorney never came to see me and couldn't pronounce ligature. He kept saying literature and no one corrected him. I'm like, you've got to be kidding. And I thought to myself, I think my role is to be available for the other side. And I've never seen a reason why the defenders do not have the same level of expertise on their side, or why it's even a side. Um, so that's when I became a forensic consultant. And during that time period, um, I went back to Indianapolis to take care of my mother. And I never worked in Indiana, which is a coroner system. And it's an old fashioned coroner system. Um, where the coroner just needs a driver's license and nothing else. You don't need a medical degree. You can have a GED and work as a coroner. You, you're elected. And so I um, initially tried to help the coroner, who was a chiropractor at that time. Um, Indianapolis being a major city with major sports teams, uh, major employers, um, had one of the worst setups. It actually made me want to be back in the old DC office. It was so bad. Uh, no air, no hot water, no ventilation, and uh, didn't have very good supplies. And yet with the drug trade coming up from Mexico through Texas on the way uh, through uh, Chicago and up to Canada, uh, just tremendous uh, drug wars had broken out in Indianapolis. So as quiet as it's kept, uh, in the 10 years that I was there, our homicide rate increased 100%. Even though it was smaller than uh, Chicago, uh, it was on line with that. Sometimes having uh, multiple doubles and triple homicides. And we saw that the, um, they had a good public defender's office trying, but uh, they weren't getting too far. If I can be of help, I, I can be easily found. I, I keep a suitcase packed. The forensic pathologist is to be a bridge between the patient and the doctor, the family and law enforcement, defense and prosecutor, science and medicine. We're one of the few non-hospital-based medical specialties. Our training is as long as those who do neurosurgery. As my training is, neutrality is a must. We were trained, if you're going to meet with the prosecutor, then you meet with the defense. You don't share the information, but you should make yourself available. But a lot of people today do not share that same feeling. They don't always want to be available. I would say that even in Indianapolis, whenever I had a meeting with the public defender's office, the prosecutor would want to sit there. I'm like, no, you don't mm -hmm. get to sit here. Uh, everyone has the same confidence. This is between a forensic pathologist, a coroner's pathologist, expert witness, and medical examiner. Uh, the term medical examiner is those who are employed by a government entity to determine how citizens die. A forensic pathologist is you, that person. You should be board certified and have at least five years of experience in general pathology and handling cases. A coroner's pathologist does not have to be a forensic pathologist, and that's one of the big issues. Forensic pathology and general pathology are actually two different things. Uh, general pathologists generally do autopsies in a community hospital setting. They uh, only work on natural deaths, and they send those results to the treating physician. They're not really skilled at non-natural deaths. Those really belong in the purview of those who are allowed to certify deaths, which would be generally the medical examiner, the uh, coroner, 
the um, military and or a judge, of course, in this in Texas, Justice of the Peace. Um, so there's a difference in those, and yet I'm all of those. I'm certainly a general pathologist. I've gone on to, to my specialty. Uh, but just uh, an expert witness is generally an independent forensic pathologist who is employed by either a family or law firm to assist them in cases. So the old term of forensic medicine has now embodied uh, forensic pathology because we have so many other entities in forensics. Uh, forensic entomology, forensic geology, forensic engineering. Everyone's adding forensic on because it's really, really popular on, on TV. But the forensic medicine is what we generally teach investigators so they have an understanding of what we're, what we're needing for them to look at and observe at, at the scene. So understanding the um, anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, what goes wrong. Generally what we're explaining to the uh, jury is what has gone wrong and why. So I used to teach an investigator's master course at George Washington for um, military master's level that would go on to work for the federal in investigative bodies. Now we have board certification for deaf investigators, which we help uh, develop uh, through name, and that's been going on now for about, about 10 years. Okay. So understanding forensic medicine, you know, the general population thinks that we actually do have body chalk outlines on the street, and we get the time, and the history of that, if, if you don't know, that was done for the media to show where the body was back in the 40s and 50s, so they wouldn't see the body, but that actually was done for the media. This is actually, uh, a um, sleeping bag, but Los Angeles uh, County Coroner's Office is known for selling their things. So. My hero, Harry <laughs> Mason, he knew everything. I listen to him now, he talks about all other types of law that have nothing to do with criminal. I'm like, well, how did they do that back in those days? 